Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built, has been getting rave reviews in the media, and it's done so well that, according to Duncan, it's going to be released in 12 different languages. He's a veteran in the tech industry and the investment side. Um, it's currently based in Be Beijing, and he's the chairman of consultancy firm BDA China. Apparently, uh, Jack Ma gave him a thumbs up on the book, and he's going <laughs> to, apparently, yep. So everyone's curious about his views about Alibaba's corporate strategy and its future. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Duncan Clark. Um, I should say Jack's thumbs up on my book. I've heard from two people. I haven't actually witnessed his thumbs up. So it could be a finger as far as, I'm, I'm, as I know. But I haven't been sued. And so if I am, lawyers are in the room, which is good to know. Um, yeah, he's an iconic figure. Um, the reason I wanted to just cover three quick things and then do as much as possible on Q&A, um, because this is an inquisitive lot. And long may Hong Kong be an inquisitive place. <laughs> um, why, are we, you know, uh, why are we talking about this company, firstly, in terms of what is the machinery behind Alibaba? What, how did it get to where it is today? And secondly, the person, the man, and actually the women behind the company. In fact, um, a third of Alibaba's co-founders are women. In fact, half of the co-founders, 18 of them, uh, half of them are actually still active in some way <clears throat> in the company. So that's an interesting sort of uh, contrast with Silicon Valley. And thirdly, um, what does this all mean, including for here in Hong Kong, but for the, the, the wider world of uh, China, as we look at China uh, rising whatever it's doing, coming back. <laughs> um, firstly, just a, a, a impossible chart, which is, uh, this is an impossible triangle, and this to me summarizes why we're talking about Alibaba today. This is what I call the architecture of trust, um, bringing together three things, e-commerce, logistics, and finance. This is why Alibaba is the impactful company that it is. Um, uh, China is a very low trust environment. The rarest commodity in China is, other than fresh air in Beijing, which is getting better now, <laughs> is uh, trust. Um, and so offline commerce already was not a particularly uh, happy place. Um, and I moved to Beijing from Hong Kong actually in 94. I remember how difficult it was to find things, pay for things um, in the state-owned shops. So one of these sides of these triangles really is the e-commerce empire that he's built. Um, initially was the Alibaba.com business. Um, which was an okay business. Uh, it was a business to business business, as you may remember. And a lot of Hong Kong, uh, the, the, the history of Alibaba has a, a strong connection with Hong Kong in those early years in 99, 2000s, when it was in the age, down in the old uh, Goldman Sachs office where it started off. It was a B2B business. And I stupidly was, I, I was very happy to have met Jack in 99 in the small apartment in Hangzhou where he founded the company. But I didn't really like the business model that much. I did actually work for them as a consultant, but I didn't invest when I was given the chance uh, to buy shares at 30 cents, uh, which expired in 2003. And so I, um, I've learned not to underestimate Jack. That was a $30 million mistake, uh, US. So any uh, sales of the books, I thank you for uh, any small donations you can make. But, uh, um, so, but the, the main angle, uh, the main side of the triangle we're going to talk about today is really Taobao and Tmall. So Taobao is you know, searching for treasure. It's the consumer-facing websites. And Tmall, which came from 2008, 9 on, which is more the brand selling to consumers. But Taobao, the scrappy kind of market in the street, has been brought online by, by Alibaba. And they did that critically by launching in 2003, just after I decided not to exercise my right to buy the shares. They launched um, Taobao. They took on eBay. And you know we can read that in the book. But they also launched Alipay. And Alipay gave the escrow the ability to trust. You know, you can actually, today, it's. You know, in a very low trusting environment in China, you have a lot of power as a consumer. If you don't like the goods that you're getting, you don't have to pay for them. You can return them within seven days. And you'll often see, if you go to Beijing, you'll see people going outside of office buildings or apartments where all these crazy number of couriers are coming and trying on sweaters. They don't like that. Take it back. You know? So the consumer has more power in China than the US and anywhere else in, um, because it's, 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 they've never had it before. So the internet, this is the explosive uh, impact of the internet on China. And if those of you who follow Mary Meeker, who just had her annual slide deck, and she said the same thing, that the internet is so much more pervasive in people's lives in China, perhaps not in you know, um, furthering democracy and freedom of the press and so on, but in, in terms of the consumer aspects, enabling uh, people. And the a third part of that triangle, other than uh, e-commerce and finance, is logistics. And in the book, I describe how this bizarre story of how in this little village, town not too far from Hangzhou, a place called Tonglu, Today, three of the four largest courier companies in China are based. In fact, the principles of these companies are often related to each other. It's as if 
UPS, FedEx, and DHL were all based in a small rural town in sort of Tennessee or something. And today, these companies, are, that's a core part of the uh, success of Alibaba. And actually, subject to SEC looking right now, what is the relationship between Tainiao or China Smart Logistics, this association of e-commerce companies? And this will take us into the, um, the story of Zhejiang province. And I think one thing I hope to achieve with this book um, is to shed a, shine a light on the amazing entrepreneurial culture of Zhejiang, a province which can be a little bit hard to pronounce. Um, one of the triangle, before I move on from this, is a golden triangle. This is what Jack calls the iron triangle, the, the three things I described. But a golden triangle we can also talk about between Jack Ma, Masayoshi Son, and Jerry Yang. So, of course, uh, Masayoshi Son from SoftBank was a very early investor in uh, Yahoo, uh, very early, I mean, within months of the founding of the company, and also within, um, into uh, Alibaba. So he's played a critical role, and I mention this because just last week, for the first time, SoftBank has announced they're selling down some of their shares. So it's interesting to think about that relationship between Jack and Masayoshi Son, and also, of course, Jerry Yang, and I'll talk more about that. So two triangles, the iron triangle, the machinery, and then sort of golden triangle of the individuals, the key figures that have, their fate is very much intertwined now. So Zhejiang province uh, um, is a place where everything is made, probably most of the things in this room, except the colonial bits, um, were either made or traded in Yiwu, um, maybe they were paid for with some dodgy financing out of Wenzhou, uh, because everything's made in Zhejiang, including dodgy financing. And, uh, um, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a province of incredible um, economic activity. I think at one point there was 45 million people of, and 10 million economic entities in Zhejiang. So you know, pretty much everybody, I think cats and dogs are registered as companies in Zhejiang. You know, everybody's trading. Um, and in this slide, I mean, basically your electric scooters, your socks, um, your ties, um, there's one Sock City in Zhejiang, another we should say in southern Jiangsu. I guess one city is called Sock City, that's the left Sock City. There's another which is the right Sock City. Um, everything is made in Zhejiang. Um, it, it might be made also in Guangdong, of course, but it's probably traded through cities like Yiwu, which is an inland city. Um, and yet it has a very large airport now, because it's connected not just within China, but around the world, particularly the Middle East and Africa. Um, the thing you probably, hopefully, used this morning, your toothbrush, 98% of the world's toothbrushes are made uh, in one town in Zhejiang. Um, and so this toothbrush actually has an added sort of symbol. When I moved, went, went to visit the company in 1999, Alibaba had just been founded. I actually went there because of the South China Morning Post, which of course Alibaba now owns. My colleague uh, Ted Dean and I um, used to have a column called Beijing Byte back when BYTE, Beijing Byte, that was a trendy thing. It was rather embarrassing. Uh, Christy Lou Stout from CNN had actually founded the column and then I, Ted and I inherited it. Ted actually wrote a story about Alibaba in August um, 99. And I, after reading his column, and Ted is a very unexcitable fellow, but he came back very excited about this. Ted is now Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for the United States until January, anyway, um, with the Obama administration. So he's gone on to great things. We worked together for 12 years. But I knew when he came back very excited about Jack um, and this company I should go visit. And when I walked in, I saw actually two mugs of toothbrushes in the bathroom indicating actually 20 people were basically working around the clock. They wouldn't go home. <laughs> so the toothbrush to me is a symbol both of his entrepreneurial endeavor and a team's endeavor. But also when I did my research into Zhejiang and the early history of the private sector in China, I came across a story from actually going back here on the coast to Wenzhou. I think it was in 1983, the Wenzhou government invited in or summoned effectively people involved in business um, and arrested them all as speculators because People forget how, you know, Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour, which we all talk about, the opening of, you know, China, that wasn't until the early 90s, right? So full 10 years before, people in Zhejiang were already emerging, you know, these town and village enterprises. They were selling surplus agricultural production. They were starting to make things. Um, but in, in, it was a bit too early for some of these people to be comfortable and, and uh, be safe. And in fact, the following year, the Wenzhou government summoned again a, a group of business people. Um, and they all carried... Um, toothbrushes in their pocket because they expected to go to prison. And in Chinese prisons, apparently, they do not provide you, well, lots of things, but certainly not toothbrushes. Um, and so this symbol of these toothbrush-toting entrepreneurs, when we think today of the risk that even, frankly, a Jack Ma takes with the government or others, it pales when you think back to the very extent, existential risks that entrepreneurs have had, you know, have had in the early days. And they were treated very much as uh, Beverly Hillbillies, you know, beyond the pale. There's a a, a, a phrase in China, the guti hu, like this, like unwashed, you know. And it, it is like the Beverly Hillbillies. There's a lot of resonance in this story, frankly, with the U.S. in terms of the rags to riches and, you know, 
Um, and many government officials wouldn't be seen meeting these entrepreneurs. And uh, Jack himself, his struggles before he founded Alibaba, he founded two companies, one of which didn't really go anywhere, and the second failed, partly because the government uh, just didn't want people like him involved in what they were doing, including in the internet. Um, but I, as part of my research, I should like to thank Dow Jones as, uh, as part of this, uh, although I did pay for a subscription to Factiva. I'm half Scottish, so paying for things, including shares in Alibaba, proved too painful. But I did shell out for a Factiva subscription for a year. And through Factiva, I was able to unearth a story about Jack in a local newspaper in Australia um, shortly after Alibaba had got a bit of profile. Um, and it was about the story of Jack here, um, 15 years old, with a guy called David Morley, 12 years old. David is now my age. We are the same age. Uh, he was my, my age then. Um, he's today 47. He's kept his hair. He runs a yoga studio in New South Wales. But I actually tracked him down by calling around the David Morley's. I'd read about this Morley-Ma relationship. So the point of the story is that you know, how do entrepreneurs emerge from obscurity or how do they get their lucky break? Uh, actually, there was this sort of unknown, really, story um, about this Australian family. This is in 1980. Uh, Jack would walk up to tourists on the river, on the banks of the uh, West Lake uh, in Hangzhou, outside what is today the Shangri-La Hotel, and say, hey, you know, I'm, I speak some English. I'd like to show you my town. By the way, today, if a student walks up to you in Beijing or Shanghai or Hangzhou saying, I'm a student, I want to show you my town, don't do it. They're going to take you to a tea house. They're going to rip you off about 2,000 kwai. And if you don't pay up, you know, you're going to have some problems. But 1980 was a simpler, more innocent time. And don't forget, of course, um, Kissinger, uh, sorry, Nixon and, and, and retinue had passed through you know, six years prior. But uh, Hangzhou was a reasonably early city to open up. In 1979, I think there were uh, 700 tourists foreign tourists that came there. The next year, there were 40,000. Amongst them were this Morley family. So fast forward, basically, David here uh, and Jack became friends. They became pen pal friends. I've embarrassingly printed one of Jack's pen pal letters in the, <laughs> in the book. But the key thing is actually uh, David's father, a guy called Ken, uh, took an interest in sort of sponsoring Jack, uh, who he called a barrow boy, um, uh, you know, somebody from basically emerging from the, the streets. Just had that kind of chutzpah. I think of Jack as part Irish with Blarney, and he's part Jewish. He's got the chutzpah uh, in a sort of Chinese package. But this you know, short fellow who's unusual looking, just walking up and saying, you know, I want to sort of show you my town. Um, this sparked an interest also in, in David's father, Ken. And Ken ended up sporting Jack, including financially helping him through university and buying him and his wife, Kathy, an apartment. Not the apartment where they founded Alibaba, but a, a predecessor, which basically allowed them to take some risks. And the irony of the whole situation is, of course, that Ken Morley uh, was a committed socialist. Uh, Ken's wife was a member of the Australian Communist Party. They had taken um, their three children to Hangzhou in 1980 to show them a socialist paradise. They also went to Cuba the next year. Um, so the irony, of course, now Asia's richest man um, was really created by an Australian uh, lefty. So anyway. Um, but the Morley family have been very gracious in sharing me their pictures. And um, so such an interesting sort of interest in this story in China that, yes, my book itself was pirated. We'll talk about piracy. And it was available briefly on Alibaba's own website on Taobao until the Wall Street Journal and some others pointed this out. Um, anyway, so this story of this, frankly, slightly schmaltzy story, but who doesn't like a schmaltzy story of you know, luck um, that came out uh, through the research. And that was all through a subscription to Factiva. And I'm a bit late on paying my bill. So sorry for anybody from Dow Jones. I'm going to do that today. Another lucky break in 1998, I think uh, Jerry Yang uh, visited Beijing. And Jack was then a functionary for the Ministry of Commerce and was actually sent to, uh, as a tour guide, basically, to take Jerry. I met Jerry on the same trip. On, the, on Jerry's uh, right here, uh, to Jerry's right, is Kathy, uh, Jack's wife. A lot of the pictures you see of Jerry and Jack, they've sort of cropped out Kathy. Maybe she doesn't want to be featured so much. But she played a very important role. As I mentioned, women played an important role in Alibaba's history. And uh, she was a, a co-founder of Alibaba and was very active in the company's early years. Uh, but in this case, Jerry and Jack um, struck up a friendship Jackson, very amenable fellow. Um, and fast forward, uh, this was before Jerry, uh, sorry, before Jack had founded Alibaba. But by um, 2005, Jerry Yang and Yahoo would pay, take a billion dollar investment into the company, buying 40% of the company, beginning this golden triangle that I mentioned, the relationship between um, their common backer, SoftBank. So it's quite an interesting story of uh, luck and making your own luck. Um, Jack likes to say, you know, Jack, by the way, likes to say many things. He's a stand up comedian. Um, he, like a comedian, he has what we call bits. He doesn't just get up and say whatever. He actually repeats himself in a way which is appropriate for the audience, uh, which I'm trying to emulate here, but maybe failing. But um, 
he has actually, we analyzed as part of my research, I went back through all of his speeches from Alibaba and before in English and Chinese, and I realized he's often actually been giving the same speech, but he's, he's such so well honed stock of stories uh, and so effective, uh, but it never feels sort of stale. I mean, he has an amazing charisma. Like him or not, you've got to admit the guy, uh, as I said, has, has chutzpah and has blarney. Um, and part of this helped, the second chapter of my book is called Jack Magic. It's not my word. It's not like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid too much. I mean, I clearly you know, find him an interesting fellow, but these people were drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, they were actually working with him. Some of the, his co-founders had also worked with him in the previous venture and even the previous, previous venture. So he had what Joe Tsai, as you know, who lives here in Hong Kong and sort of pursued by bankers and lawyers around town when he's walking around Central. Um, Joe um, said his first impression when he met Jack wasn't just that, um, you know, Jack was charismatic, but there was this team. It was a huge team. He called them disciples, you know. And uh, another person who noticed this was my classmate from Morgan Stanley, a woman called Shirley Lin, who very uh, helpfully helped me on the book. Um, she, she told me her stories. She, at Goldman Sachs, ended up, uh, she had moved to Goldman. They bought half the company for $5 million because they also were very impressed. It wasn't just Jack. It was the fact that it was just these committed disciples with this very strong work ethic and family style. It's not for everybody. It's a little happy clappy if you're, you know, um, but certainly in Hangzhou, there were very few choices for entrepreneurs or, or for graduates. Um, and a lot of them were, were drawn to Jack and people still are drawn uh, to Jack. There's a feel good story in my book, by the way, because Goldman, in their wisdom, sold, uh, half, of their, sold half of the company, basically, um, and uh, for basically what could have been worth $150 billion, um, they got $20 million. So my story is not as bad, frankly, as uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Blank finds. And uh, apparently he did actually call up and ask how much he would have made personally during the, tw the famous 2014 IPO and was told I think $850 million personally would have been Lloyd Blank finds. That's a, um, that's a few mansions in the Hamptons still. Um, so anyway, who doesn't like to feel good about a, a Goldman uh, failure? No, we love Goldman, or do we? I don't know. Um, so I also took this map to the United States to tell people where they live, that they now live in Guigu and Zhoujinshan and uh, Xiaotu. I mean, basically, these are Alibaba's offices up the West Coast. Um, I'm a Brit who grew up in New Jersey and Paris, so I don't know where my accent is, but I'm a bit, I feel a bit Paul Revere-like saying the Chinese are coming, except the Chinese are already here in America, we all know this. Um, just some interesting facts about this. So Jack discovered the internet in Seattle, and I went back to, to see the little office building where he did, um, and I described the whole story. <clears throat> they have a small office there, but they're very much in, in San Francisco, they're in also now San Mateo. And interestingly, uh, in Hollywood, although their office, which they just opened officially last week, um, is not in Hollywood, it's actually in Pasadena. And those of you who know Los Angeles know that the entertainment business is in West LA. Um, but the good Chinese food is actually in the San Gabriel Valley to the east. So controversially, Alibaba's pictures of business is in Pasadena. So all these people, film moguls, are having to bloody drive to Pasadena for the first time. Um, anyway, so they're kind of disrupting media there. Um, and uh, you know, I should add, they're also in New York and Washington with lobbying and you know, we see the SEC and the IP issues that they're facing. They're also in Europe now in uh, Munich, Paris, Milan, London. Their thesis is to bring Western brands into the Chinese consumers on Tmall. This is why the IP issues are so critical to them. It's not about helping Chinese come to America or come to the West, helping these merchants sell, which was initially the model of B the B2B. It's about bringing the Western brands to the Chinese consumer. But on the media side, here's Jack with some, some guy. Uh, that he met, and um, you know, there's a lot of films coming out that Alibaba Pictures is going to be sponsoring, including uh, this year will be Star Trek, Teen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This was for Mission Impossible. Um, but this raises another question: is you know, why are they moving into both finance, media, entertainment, and also what is the relationship with other people like uh, his Jack with some other person um, that in 2007 visited his offices? At the time, this person was. Um, a party secretary for Shanghai. He had been party secretary for Zhejiang. Uh, but interesting, I didn't find evidence of him actually visiting Alibaba while he was actually party secretary. And if you go back, fast forward, or fast rewind to 2000, I hosted for Alibaba a conference on the shores of the West Lake with the then vice governor of Zhejiang and the governor, and I asked her, actually, the vice governor, how, how do you feel about the private sector? And she's, I remember saying, we just stay out of their way. Uh, coming from Beijing, where I've been living, that was a big shock. I don't think it's necessarily the case anymore. Um, but these companies are becoming so big, both Alibaba and Tencent, um, to some extent Baidu. We've seen a lot of run-ins with Baidu recently over the cancer and pharma ads. You know, these companies, these, these internet companies have a huge social impact. So I hedge, in my book, the last chapter is called is Icon or Icarus. Jack is clearly an icon. 
But, you know, like Icarus, could he be flying too close to the Sun King, <laughs> in this case? Um, I, a bad joke that if he needed a pair of uh, wax and feather wings, like Icarus, uh, I'm sure he could find a pair on Taobao. There's probably nine million merchants selling those things. But um, he has to, he treads a very careful line. And this brings us to why did he buy the South China Morning Post? Still unclear. And why also did he invest in some Chinese media assets as well? Is this to gain you know, space, frankly, for him to pursue other ambitions? Because if you think about it, the media business is probably the most problematic. Uh, it's small scale. I mean, look at his South China Morning Post. It's a reasonably big investment for Hong Kong. But for Alibaba, it's, it's really nothing. Um, why did they do that? Well, you know, he's also trying to move into critical areas like in finance. You know, um, uh, he's already pushed a bit into finance, not just through Alipay, but through what he had, the Yu Abao Leftover Treasure Fund, which, as you know, became one of the world's largest uh, money market funds within eight months. Now, leftover treasure, the Yu Abao, mean, should mean just pocket change. You can put your pocket change into an account. We'll pay you a few, few extra, uh, well, you pay actually up to 2% extra interest. Um, but of course, you know, when your $100 billion goes into that account, um, and some people are transferring hundreds of thousands of dollars, this isn't really leftover change. Well, it is for some billionaires, I guess. But uh, this is reality that Alibaba is increasingly bumping into the state. And I think what we're seeing is going to be a negotiated transfer of power from the incumbents, the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, to more innovative, dynamic companies. But there's also risk in that. I mean, just imagine, I was just talking with a lawyer friend last night, imagine if Alipay went down for... 30 minutes in China. And you talk about run on the banks, so you talk about financial <laughs> instability. So increasingly, they're going to have to be much more you know, part of the system. Um, and yet, can they do that? Now, Jack has a saying for everything. As I mentioned, he says, fall in love with the government, but don't marry them. Um, and in that, you know, what he's expressing is, of course, you know, the innovative capacity and all that consumer-facing stuff is diminished when you, you know, frankly, tie up with the government. Um, I also say that if he did marry the government, he would be a polygamist, not just for Kathy, but for um, there are so many branches of the Chinese government that how would you choose one? Uh, but the reality is he does have to deal every day with advances from different government agencies, uh, let alone all the foreigners who are trying to track him down, whether it be having lunch at the White House or getting the Légion d'honneur two weeks ago or meeting the King of Belgium just within the last three weeks. <laughs> you know, that's his sort of foreign stuff. But in domestically, I... I uh, interviewed, I, was, I saw him at 10 Downing Street where he's actually an advisor to the current Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, we'll see, um, on business. And actually, he told people, uh, you know, 40,000 government officials visited Alibaba last year, Chinese government officials. I think one of the reasons he travels so much and potentially is based partly in Hong Kong is just to get away from all these people. Because what happens if the vice governor from such and such province clashes with the governor of another province and the minister of commerce? And so he's constantly bombarded by this. Um, so. A fine line, you know. Um, anyway, so um, that's opening up. We can talk about IP, we can talk about government, SCMP. Let's take some questions. Can you outline the main risks involved in Alibaba given the SEC investigation of Alibaba? And the second is, what are the chances that Jack Ma or Alibaba might be investigated by the Chinese anti-corruption campaign itself? The second one, I don't really have any visibility into. I mean, Wang Qichan obviously is the big the big honcho there. I've just been hearing the Wanti Chan. Some say he might be the next premier again because he's, you know, we sorely missed, I think, in some quarters. Um, I, yeah, I, we haven't, we have seen some entanglements of entrepreneurs with uh, the anti-corruption and so on. Uh, a lot of it seemed to have spec centered around the last year's uh, stock markets, uh, turmoil, uh, either sort of front running the national, you know, team trying to dump stocks or make money from this. So in the book I described, so chapter 12, um, uh, the Icarus uh, part of it. I mean, uh, already Guo Guanchang from Foshun, you know, had his tea with the government for a few days. He seems to be fine now. He's just here having their annual party last week. But certainly, it, it raised questions for many people, like what, how uh, invulnerable are these uh, entrepreneurs? It's very hard to predict that. There's really no transparency in that. But I think uh, I had I was on Swarkbox with CNBC in New York, and Andrew Ross Sorkin, who wrote, you know, uh, Too Big to Fail, was was the, the anchor of that morning. I said, well. Hopefully for Jack, Alibaba is too big to nail in a way, but it's no guarantee. Um, but I think, you know, I think Alibaba has made itself central to this image and reality, actually, of creating a consumer economy. Now, they can't do this overnight because China needs to shift from the made in China model to a bought in China and ultimately designed in China future. Um, but they're very useful. I call them like a bright and shiny object. But certainly, Li Keqiang, the prime minister, has often appeared with Jack and talk about the internet plus economy, which nobody else 
talks about. But in China, government officials are talking a lot about how the internet can be helping move the fulcrum, if you will, uh, from uh, towards a consumer-driven economy. The other stuff takes time, and Xi Jinping has talked about supply side uh, restructuring and so on. I mean, it's going to be very hard to change the factory output, to change the labor markets, pension. The big thing is that Chinese consumers save too much money because they, again, don't trust. So they have a lot of mattress money. We need to release this, if we're following the American model, <laughs> to a two-thirds consumer-driven model from a 40% consumer-driven model. But again, that doesn't happen overnight. So I think there's some insulation, in a way, by the nature of this business. In terms of the SEC investigation, we don't actually know yet. We know broadly three themes, I think, about the Tainyao thing that I mentioned, the logistics company we also know about. They're looking into the um, Singles Day 11-11 uh, Taobao Festival. And my opening scene is that almost sense of incredulity at these numbers on these screens. It is an amazing experience. Uh, it's like being in NORAD in one of these nuclear sort of maps of the world where you're seeing this traffic missiles of you know, uh, packages being delivered around the country. And, unbelievable volumes. Um, so we'll have to see. I, I don't think the logistics business itself, I mean, uh, the materiality of that is going to be that much of a concern. It's just more a question of trust. The irony of this whole thing, as I said, I started with trust. Consumers have, do trust Alibaba's websites. Maybe the brands have had issues. There's on fakes, obviously, Taobao's, my book was briefly available on, as a fake product, um, copied product. Um, but investors, the big question is, can investors really trust and I do go into chapter 11, the Alipay incident, when Jack actually transferred a very valuable asset, today estimated at over $60 billion, into his own personal account. Now, he claims, and Joe Tsai and others say he had to do this because of government regulations. It's basically not very clear. But there, there is certainly a, a, the big challenge for Alibaba, how they're going to really go to the next level, will be dispelling trust. So this SEC investigation could actually be an opportunity for them to sort of lance the boil, you know, in a way. Because, um, you know, people have been shorting the company. Look, they're a lightning rod, this company. And um, the problem with the SEC thing, we don't really know, that I don't personally know exactly the, the, the length. Or, and it's not unusual for that to happen, but certainly not helpful. Um, so we'll see. The, the most interesting chapter in the book is chapter 13. There are, there are 12 chapters in the book. <laughs> so we're all witnessing chapter 13 together. So, so I want to come back to the, the idea of uh, state-owned enterprises merging or doing something with Alibaba, and I'm specifically referring to a SARFT or SAPR. Whatever they're called now. Whatever they're called now. Yeah. Um, announcement that state-owned enterprises would be encouraged to take stakes yes. in media companies, specifically not... Alibaba was not named, but no. the implication was it was your Tencent, it was your Yoku Tudo, which of yeah. course is Alibaba now. Right. Um, how does that play out in, in this scenario of a marriage between Jack and the state? Yeah. You know? um, well, my first question, would they have to pay for their percent stake? You know, because it's, you know, it's, still, it's still a billion dollars plus or something, right? So um, it certainly wouldn't be helpful to these companies. And I, I, you know, getting into the head of the Communist Party is like, you know, it's like the Vatican, right? I mean, in terms of... So in terms of figuring out, like, would it be helpful then to be seen to be more heavily involved in these companies? I, I don't really see that in terms of the signals it might send to investors or even to domestic entrepreneurs. But then again, you know, with Xi Jinping, a consolidation of power, he's consolidated so many other things. Why not this also um, as part of his, you know, another leading group, you know, that he's set up? So, um, yeah, I think they were referring initially to streaming video sites. Um, you know, because the reality is company, uh, companies like Yoku, which uh, in, in our Alibaba controls, and Weibo, you know, Sina Weibo, they have much broader reach than CCTV, 1234X, right? Um, and they're, it's the demographic that they serve, increasing at people who are, you know, better educated, perhaps more mobile, more international even. So, so yeah, I, I, I think it would be a negative sign. My understanding, it was sort of a floated idea, and it hasn't yet gone through. It would be pretty difficult. And the reality is, I mean, w would they even need it? Because it would make something explicit that we already know. I mean, uh, and I write in the book, and this is why this book is not available in English in the mainland, is about Shi Tao, the um, journalist who was arrested for using Yahoo's you know, email, and then Yahoo Hong Kong actually shopped him to the government. You know, there's a reason why you know those types types of act actions and the ability for the government to lean on these companies, you know, is effective um, because they depend on staying in the government's good graces. And they're really large capitalized companies. Some even speculate that the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, are some some extent protected from others emerging because, in a way, the government likes big big companies. They know they can lean, lean on, they can deal with. Um, there's limits to that, though. Look at the Baidu relationship recently; it's been quite fraught. Um, Tencent, by the way, 
Uh, I find a fascinating company. I've known them a long time, but they're very discreet, very low profile. So they're kind of useless to write a book about because you can't really get much on them. Um, but Pony Ma, the founder of um, Tencent, uh, you know, I think has done an amazing, masterful job with his team of randomly Afrikaner, South African investors and others to create this massive 210 billion, they just hit their all-time high, 210 billion dollar US company. And very little is heard about them in terms of government issues or Whereas Jack, you know, Jack sometimes shoots his mouth off. I mean, after he launched his banking fund and then the banks were pushing back, you know, he looked like a drunken tweet because he does like to have a drink once in a while. Who doesn't? Um, uh, he criticized by name, well, uh, the, some of the, the government policies and uh, Alibaba people have also criticized by name government officials saying this guy's useless, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's fun. I mean, you can sell popcorn when you have a Chinese government official you know, go, laying into a, an entrepreneur and vice versa. That's a sign of the tensions on the frontier, yeah. I should say that in addition to 11.11, which is the uh, singles day, um, Jack recently just declared 9.9, um, nine, nine, Jojo. So nine, like in English, nine and wine sound the same. Jo and Jo in Chinese also. And September 9th will be wine tasting day in China. And I know Hong Kong is a big wine trading center. And Jack conveniently has just bought a chateau called the Chateau de Source in Bordeaux. Um, and he declared this with Matteo Renzi at Vinitalia in Verona. Um, but this has been opening up to world providers of wine. So anyway, um, big party coming. Somebody else pointed out to me that 9-9 is also the day that Mao died, I think. So it might have been un unfortunate, but it's a sign of how, you know, the calendar is getting a little bit crowded between the old state and the new stuff. Anyway, September 9th, if you do have an opportunity in advance to buy some stocks of wine, you might get, get some good sales on that day. Okay, uh, Florence, and then the gentleman over there. Thank you. I'm Florence de Changy with Le Monde. Um, first, thank you. It's uh, fascinating. Um, what about this vision? Is it just getting bigger and richer? Well, that's a good point. I mean, in terms of the philosophy, uh, for, sorry, philanthropy, and also philosophy of the company, both he and Joe have set up one of the, or actually China's largest philanthropic organizations. They're very active here in Hong Kong. They've been hiring professional managers, including some of their former colleagues from Goldman and others to manage their money, the company's money for philanthropy. He talks a lot about environmental causes, um, speculations, and he talks a lot about cancer. Uh, people speculate, people close to him have been affected by it. Um, you know, the environmental legacy of all the stuff I showed you earlier, you know, of these toothbrushes. I mean, that's an oil-based product, right? So, so there's a clearly a raising consciousness uh, aspect of what they are trying to achieve. Um, the, the general mission of the company is a little broad. They talk about health and happiness. So health being healthcare, investing in a pharmaceutical company, trying to, you know, improve um, healthcare in China, which, as you know, is terrible. I mean, great doctors, but you can never get to them because there's a line of 10,000 people outside the Sierra Hospital in Beijing, you know. So there's elements of healthcare that he wants to get involved, but also happiness. What he talks about, you know, the uh, Hollywood stuff is to bring, you know, uh, cheery endings, sort of uh, uplifting stories to China. As you know, most Chinese movies, when you watch them, all the heroes die, very depressing. Um, so he wants to bring this sort of uplifting content. Uh, they have TBO as well, Taobao box office, or Tmall box office, like an HBO style streaming thing. They're investing in movies. So it's a bit fluffy, to be honest, I mean, in terms of, it, 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 but it reflects the changing nature of the Ch Chinese consumer. Um, more specifically, they're talking about cloud computing. Um, which is, you know, including media and other things that they can host. Uh, and the data, the, analyzing all the data, because that triangle that I showed you earlier, the amazing amount of information that Alibaba has on what people are buying, what they're intending to buy, you know, where they're being shipped, um, and, and mining that for things like credit, uh, um, credit analyses for companies, for individuals. So there's sort of a data element, and there's a rural element too, so rural Alibaba. And I actually had been saying to people, well, I don't think Alibaba will use the South China Morning Post as sort of a mouthpiece for, for the company, at least. We don't know politically what Alibaba will do with the South China Morning Post, but it'd be unlikely they would sort of use it to, to promote um, the company. And then again, I, this weekend, I saw a big one-page section on Taobao villages. I thought, well, okay, maybe I've been a bit too ambitious about that. Mind you, News Corp used to do that. Well, my, the News Corp is my publisher indirectly, but uh, in the UK with Sky and Sun, you know, the Sun, there was often crossover promotion. So maybe they are using the South German Post <laughs> race. But Jack, I should, on the, on the entertainment and the media side, both Jack and Joe Tsai have addressed the South German Post and said, we will respect editorial independence. And yet, of course, in the same breath, they've said, but we want the world to have a more positive image of China or better understanding of China. This is clearly something they believe in as much as they believe in, I think, the philanthropic stuff that they're doing. But of course, they're running into quite a lot of uh, cynicism or skepticism on that. So this is, you know, this is the frontier that they're on internationally, just as they're domestically on the frontier with the state companies, I think. 
I mean, I've been, I've been sort of following Alibaba closely for about four years, so a lot less longer than you have. But in that time, I've seen them make investments in uh, electronics retailers in China, yeah. health companies in Hong Kong, film companies, football clubs, newspapers, um, kind of all kinds of stuff. And uh, also spread between sort of investments by Alibaba, investments by Jack Ma personally or through yeah. his private equity fund, investments throughout financial. And I just wonder... Do you think there is anybody, do you think Jack Ma himself, or is there somebody else at Alibaba or in that kind of group who actually has a sort of a comprehensive view of all of these investments? And is there some sort of like logic behind it that is not apparent to those of us looking at it from the outside? I feel your pain because I know your colleague Paul Carsten is a friend of mine in Beijing who many, a, many an evening has been ruined by, God, they've bought something else again, or a whole weekend, like, what the hell? I just thought, you know, and, and uh, the, the rapidity uh, and the volume of the sort of uh, investments has certainly surprised a lot of people. Um, and you're right, I mean, sometimes it's through Alibaba, sometimes it's through Yunfeng, and I write a bit about that. Um, Yun is Ma Yun, you know, um, his, one of his names, and then the co-founder. Uh, they had this uh, private equity fund. Uh, Jack was, uh, is an LP. I think at one point was a general partner. So this raised questions in some minds of conflicts and how do they work this out. I think he's no longer, my understanding, a general partner of that fund. Um, and then there are other groups, there are other entities. And, and Cai Niao, the logistics company that I mentioned and subject now to SEC looking into this. Uh, what is the relationship? The reason it's important is because JD, their biggest competitor in e-commerce, is not um, tr trying to be what we call an asset light company. They're owning warehouses, they're owning inventory, they're more like Amazon. Alibaba positions itself um, as not investing in this, in, you know, a warehouse. But ultimately, if they are subsidizing this through other means, they have a 49% stake. Anyway, so it, it's a web, it's a web. And I think one thing I can hope to add in the book is that Zhejiang is just a crazy web of companies. If you look at the co-ownerships, the, the weird relationships, almost middle, century, middle ages style mercantilism, um, guilds almost like between the relationships between these companies and yet you have like I think of a 2D regulation but a kind of 3D kind of capital structures and deal making in China and that is going to be causing them you know some challenges I mean Zhou Tsai is a you know is a very accomplished uh, lawyer uh, um, uh, financier now for many years he's been there since uh, September 99 uh, the bigger deals certainly he's playing a big role in he's been a big part of explaining some of those, but there's a lot of other stuff happening and also other partners of Alibaba, former shareholders or co-founders have gone off, like Simon Xie is a co-founder of Alipay or the Ant Financial. It's complicated. So um, they, you know, to some extent, they're, they're gonna have to improve explaining how these things work in advance and the logic, uh, and it's quite fluffy. You know, Some of these investments don't seem to have immediate logic. I was in Singapore with Joe Tsai two weeks ago and Alibaba had just purchased uh, Lazada, a rocket internet uh, generated uh, e-commerce platform in Southeast Asia. Now, a lot of people in the industry think they weren't doing very well. Rocket in Germany itself is not doing very well. Um, but Joe was, was saying, you know, they've built a business which is across different countries and cultures, and that's something we can build on. And to some extent, Alibaba can, you know, turn on the taps if they connect other e-commerce platforms to Taobao or AliExpress, which is their international website. There's, there's a lot of stuff moving through the Alibaba network, whether it be goods or data, money, that can actually create a lot of value, um, but managing that, yeah. And, and I think getting the team, their biggest challenge in the future is not gonna be just tech people in Zhejiang or translators. And Jack famously is not a tech person, so he's always relied on scaling up others. Uh, but now they're gonna have to get people who are active and understand the media business in Los Angeles and uh, you know, uh, the healthcare industry. And Alibaba's just launched, for those of you who have children or friends, or even you are uh, in your mid-20s, Alibaba's just launched something called the Alibaba Leadership Global Leadership Academy, so they're gonna hire 102 people, because Jack wants a 102 year history for Alibaba. Uh, I think we're 102 people in the room, which is great. Uh, 1999 to 2100, whatever. Um, anyway, 102 people, six, 18 month internships in Hangzhou, uh, and then travel uh, off in the world to different places. And I think that's gonna be their big challenge. Can they create a culture, an international culture, of the same you know, uh, logic in the way that holds the company together domestically. But even domestically, there's a lot of challenges, I think. So you're right, I think uh, greater transparency, and, and Joe does an excellent job, investors love hearing from Joe, but you know, deals just keep, seem to come, you know, and not always immediately obvious. And, and that's just the nature of who Jack is. Jack, actually a friend of mine was being introduced to different entrepreneurs by Jack, he was a diplomat, um, and uh, Jack made a point. Every entrepreneur who he went to was self-made person, self-made person. So Jack has tremendous in, uh, faith in those self-made people, the scrappy people like him in a way. 
not so much, you know, the rich connected. So sometimes, you know, he, well, the Guangzhou Evergrande, he bought, what, 50% of the Guangzhou football team, allegedly while drunk. I mean, that's what the, the, the owner said. I got him drunk, and within 15 minutes, I'd sold him the football team. So now he's been linked to AC Milan, probably because he was in Italy promoting Italian wine sales. They thought, well, we'll just sell them AC Milan. But uh, anyway, so yeah, look, he's, he's great to write about, you know, and he's certainly interesting. Uh, but sometimes Jack perhaps is a victim of his own success and his charisma and his, his out of left fieldness is something that is very different from a more disciplined company like Tencent, for example. So it's not for everybody. But um, you know, long term, if you backed him, you've, you've uh, made your money. But uh, if you buy in the frothy IPO, you know, be careful. <laughs> Listening to you very carefully, I, I'm still a bit in the dark. I don't understand what it is that he was pitching. What what he sold and what people bought into at the beginning. At the beginning, okay. Because I don't see how you start from, from, from nowhere kid out in the country to becoming an international right. billionaire without, without okay. a rocket boost somewhere. So core thing to understanding Jack and his success, I think his ability to communicate, not just in English, but that's been very helpful. That's why he's a global figure, unlike many Chinese entrepreneurs we've never heard of. And his name is Jack. And he chose a company called Alibaba. We can pronounce all these things. Um, so he has that iconic status, to communication, his ability to sell. While he was an English teacher in his, uh, after graduating, you know, I didn't go through all the stuff you've already heard. He failed many times to get it into university. He worked, got rejected from KFC, blah, blah, blah. He eventually became an English teacher. He supplemented his in income, and I found what he was selling was plastic carpets. He would go to Canton Fair or Iwu and would go around Hangzhou, like literally on a bicycle, selling plastic carpets to people. So he's always been a merchant. He's, a, he's an entrepreneur's entrepreneur in the sense that he knows the street, and he knows his customer. He knows... You know, we were just talking um, actually with my colleague here about how, why the South China Morning Post is suddenly free. Well, a big part of his business model for Taobao was make it free. Don't charge the merchants on uh, Taobao anything to open a storefront. Um, and for six years, they didn't make any money, but ultimately he defeated eBay. Within a few years, he defeated eBay by bringing people on. Um, so he has this fundamental belief in you know, free, like get the marketplace going, bring people in and figure out they made it money in the end by advertising. Those merchants have to spend advertising money on this. So I think his sense of being on the customer side, whether it be small and medium-sized businesses or consumers today, but critical to your question, the early days, Zhejiang made all this stuff, right? But they didn't have the export channels that the Guangdong factories had. The Guangdong factories, a lot of them were set up by people here in Hong Kong or by Taiwanese or Koreans and others who were making stuff. Zhejiang started domestically, but quickly there was stuff being made and still we have this excess inventory challenge. But Jack's, what, Jack's story essentially is, was the meeting of the private sector explosion, particularly in Zhejiang, with the internet that he had this blind faith in, um, and his, his ability to communicate, build capital and team around it. That really, those three things coming together is what, and actually in the early days, Jack, before Alibaba, had his first internet company um, called China Pages, which he ultimately lost to the government, but he started to inventing a quote by Bill Gates, uh, because 1995, after Jack came back from Seattle, uh, he'd seen the internet, he sort of got the religion, uh, came back to China, set up a company helping companies go online, including a hotel that Hillary Clinton's delegation had stayed in in Hangzhou, long story. Anyway, but they couldn't understand what the internet was. He said, give me, give me uh, money and I will advertise your company in the internet. They would say, what is the internet? You know, um, he couldn't access it in China. Um, but um, he convinced them by saying, Bill Gates has said the internet is changing all aspects of our lives. Bill Gates hadn't actually said that, uh, but Jack said, well, I knew that he would. And Jack was right. Actually, within a year, Bill Gates had turned famously on the internet. And so Jack knew that he, as Jack Ma, couldn't go out and say. So he, he's had this chutzpah element, frankly, a storyteller. I mean, he, the communication thing, his parents were storytellers. Uh, they were factory workers, but they also at home practiced this art called ping tan, which is a Suzhou kind of style storyteller. So, I mean, one uncharitably could say he's a great bullshit artist. Um, but he's actually a very good bullshit artist. So there's a bit of bullshit in all this. Um, but thank God, in a way, for him and um, for all these internet entrepreneurs because they were not coming out of a state of enterprise, they weren't licensed. I'm not so naive to say there aren't those connections today, but oh. origin was chutzpah. Why Alibaba? And another frivolous question is, if he's advising David Cameron, mm. is he in or out on the Brexit question? Okay, so on the second one, I'm very much a Remain person, even though I, I'm a, I grew up in France, so what, what, why would I not be? I tried to see if Jack could come to London to sort of prognosticate on staying, and, and actually the business advisory meeting that he goes to every uh, three months is, isn't happening right now, obviously, because of the Brexit thing. So um, uh, he didn't weigh in on that. I think Wanda, I think uh, some other Chinese entrepreneurs have, and it's pretty clear that China wouldn't be very happy with Brexit in terms of 
you know, losing an ally in the corner, whatever. But I didn't get Jack to sort of come in and say, but anybody in the room, I think today's the last day to ro vote, uh, register if you're overseas Brits. Anyway, um, on the first question, Alibaba, uh, I met, I, I sought out a lot of his early competitors, critics, uh, a woman who'd set up a company called uh, Ying Highway, Internet Highway, said Jack copied Ariba.com at the time with Alibaba. I didn't find any evidence of that. Um, in other, she's a, frankly a bitter person who was, you know, uh, pushed aside. But Jack likes to say that it was, um, you know, a name that everybody knew. He tried it out on a waitress in San Francisco. Do you know Alibaba? And she said, yeah, 40 thieves. And so he knew that it was a name. Um, and we're here in a sort of cave-like structure almost. And so, you know, the imagery of Alibaba is something he's drawn on. Um, and the fact that his name was Jack and American tourists called him Jack. I mean, he's just, in a sense, he's got that. He knows what, what's going to sell, what's going to help, you know. And I think there's another book out, by the way, right now called The Wonder Way by Wang Tianlin, um, which I think is being published by Wanda. But there's a lot of frustration in some other entrepreneurs that, you know, they don't have the same appeal. But Jack's always understood, you know, his customer, even overseas. So. Okay. I now run the, the hedge fund, so it'll be good to catch up with you on that. Um, See you, and I'll, I'll call See you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Be super quick here. That one's for Elsa. Yeah. Elsa, okay. This one's for Elsa. But thanks a lot. Oh my God. If, you, if you write a name in it, you can't sell it. Oh, I see. I'm putting for Chris. There are lots of Chris's out there. There are a lot of them out there.